couch and he's ready to go and I'm here and I'm ready to go and you're there and you're ready to go and Scout's roaming around making trouble as always. She'll probably turn up. <clears throat> okay. I have allergies really bad this morning. I'm allergic to mountain cedar and mountain cedar count was 23,000 and something yesterday. And so that's giving me a little trouble this morning. So if I sound like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, that's why. Sorry. Okay, we are going to talk today about the Lincoln assassination, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. We all know that John Wilkes Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln, shot him in the back of the head at the theater while he was watching a play. We all know that pretty much. What a lot of times we don't realize and forget and don't talk about as much is the fact that this was all part of a giant, well, not giant, but a larger conspiracy that was involved in trying to decapitate the entire United States government. There was a lot more to it than just assassinating President Lincoln. There were a lot more people involved in it than just John Wilkes Booth. And that's the part that we want to talk about today. We're going to look at the whole thing and how it all fits together. So let me share my screen with my mad skills. It wasn't an earthquake. That was just Scout. Uh, stay, remain calm. There we go. Okay, we're going to start out by talking about John Wilkes Booth because he is kind of the main character in this big conspiracy. He was born May the 10th in 1838 in Harford County, Maryland. He was the ninth of 10 children, so he has one younger brother or sister and eight older brothers and sisters. His father was named Junius Brutus Booth. That's a terrible name. Junius Booth was also a famous actor. He was born in England and had come to America from England and continued to act on the stage as, a as an actor. Booth became a famous actor and also along with his older two brothers, Junius Jr. and Edwin Booth. So there were three Booth brothers that were famous actors. They were the most famous actors of this time. We know that in November of 1863, pardon me, President Abraham Lincoln and Mrs. Lincoln saw Booth perform in a theater, or in a play, pardon me, at Ford's Theater. This is the only time we know for sure that, that President Lincoln saw Booth play as an actor. We do know that this one happened. Okay. The conspiracy began <coughs> because Booth was a great supporter of slavery and the South. He met with groups of Confederate spies in the summer of 1864, and there's pretty decent evidence that these spies were sent to talk to John Wilkes Booth, who was a known supporter of the South, by the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. I don't think they've got absolute proof, but there's a pretty good indication that this was, hey, Y'all go talk to John Wilkes Booth, see if y'all can set this up for me. They hatched up a plot that was to for Booth to kidnap Lincoln and take him to the Confederate capital, which was Richmond, Virginia. And then they were going to use Booth, uh, Lincoln as a bargaining chip to secure the release of all of the prisoners that had been captured, that were the rebel prisoners, the Southern men who had been captured so that they would be released. Because we know that the South had a much smaller pool of men, a much smaller army than the North did. And so they were hurting pretty badly by 1864 with not enough men to fight for them. So they wanted all of those guys back so they could basically start over. <clears throat> the plot started to happen on March the 17th of 1865. President Lincoln was scheduled to attend a matinee performance. A matinee means it is in the afternoon at the, of a play at the Campbell Hospital, which was to benefit wounded soldiers. So it was going to raise money to help the, the wounded soldiers. Booth and a group of conspirators hid along a road to Washington, D.C. They were planning to stop the president's carriage and kidnap the president. Now, let me point out to you that at this point, no presidents had ever really been threatened with real violence. None of them had ever been killed before. Booth, uh, I'm sorry, Lincoln did not have bodyguard protection like the presidents do now. 
Part of the reason the presidents have that bodyguard protection now is because of what happened to President Lincoln. But back then, you could walk up to President Lincoln on the street and just shake his hand because he was roaming around out there by himself. He didn't have a bodyguard that went with him or a group of bodyguards that went with him. He just went where he wanted to go. It, it was a much, much different time. But Lincoln had a change of plans and he did not attend the performance. So they sat out there and waited on this road and Lincoln never showed up. So some of the conspirators got disheartened and decided to abandon the plot. But Booth and a core of conspirators, a core little group of conspirators, decided to continue on and keep trying to plan this, uh, th this plot to kidnap President Lincoln. On April the 9th of 1865, Robert E. Lee, who was the general in charge of the Southern Army, the Confederate Army, surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Grant was a former student of Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee had been a, a teacher at West Point um, Army Academy, where they trained the Army cadets and the Army officers <clears throat> for years. And Grant had been one of his students, and he had great respect for General Lee. And so he refused to arrest all of the Southerners as traitors. He allowed them to go home. He allowed them to keep their, their personal weapons and their horses and return home so that they could, you know, go home and start rebuilding their homes and their farms. The U.S. Congress was very angry about this because technically Grant did not have that much authority. He was supposed to just accept the surrender and let the Congress decide what was going to happen next. But he made this decision on his own and President Lincoln approved it. So that kind of cut Congress out and they were mad about it. But that, that's what happened. He showed, Grant showed great mercy to the South and Lincoln showed great mercy to the South. So when um, he was not planning to, to to try to punish the South in any great way, he just wanted this to be over and everybody just go home. The conspiracy continues after the surrender at Appomattox. Booth abandoned his kidnapping plans and decided he was going to assassinate the president instead. So he and his group of conspirators were planning to decapitate the government. Now, if you don't know the word decapitate, that means to cut the head off the government by killing several key figures. And they, they hoped that this would revitalize the Confederacy and restart the war. This would give the Confederacy a jolt of energy and the war would restart and this time the South would win. So on April the 14th of 1865, President and Mrs. Lincoln, a lady named Clara Harris, who was the daughter of a senator, and Major Henry Rathbone, her fiance, attended a performance of a play called Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater. Interestingly enough, Ulysses Grant and his wife were supposed to attend, but they declined because apparently Mrs. Lincoln had been heard to say some not very nice things about Mrs. Grant. And Mrs. Grant was like, oh, no, I'm not going to the theater with her. So Grant and his wife were not in attendance. These other two people were. Booth slipped into Lincoln's box. And you can see this is the picture of the, of the shooting here. You can see he's in kind of a place that's up on the second floor. And it's like a little room with a door on the back. And it was a private box. And he and his wife and the two people that were with him were in there and nobody else is in there you know this is the just the four seats in there and nobody else is in there <clears throat> the door is not locked or anything booth comes through the back of the door through the door in the back and shoots president lincoln in the back of the head uh, apparently major rathbone jumped up and tried to stop booth booth had a knife as well you can see he's got a knife there he slashed and cut Colonel, or I'm sorry, Major Rathbone from the elbow, the shoulder all the way down to his elbow with this knife. So he was kind of out of commission now too. Booth jumps from the box down onto the stage, broke his leg in the process, shouted sick semper tyrannis, the South is avenged. Sick semper tyrannis means thus always to tyrants. Booth fled and met up with accomplice David Harold, and they escaped to Southern Maryland. 
Now, while all of that's going on, a man named Lewis Powell, who was another one of the conspirators, was supposed to go and kill Secretary of State William H. Seward. Now, Seward was at his home in Washington, D.C., and he was recovering from a carriage accident he'd been in, and he had suffered a broken arm and a broken jaw. And as such, he was in this weird metal brace to keep his jaw still that came down his jaw and came down all the way to his chest to keep him from being able to move and so that his jaw would set. So he was laid up pretty bad there. Lewis Powell knocked on the door and claimed that he had medicine for Seward that must be delivered in person. So he got up to Seward's bedroom and he attacked and wounded Seward's son Frederick and Seward's nurse who was there taking care of him. Then he attacked Seward and stabbed him three times in the throat and twice in the face. But they believed that he was, Seward was saved because he had this metal brace on and, and Powell couldn't get enough distance inside his throat and inside his face to kill him. So Powell was unsuccessful. He took off and left and everyone that he attacked survived. So the three people that he stabbed survived. This was an unsuccessful attack, even though he wounded Seward pretty badly. George Atzerodt, I think is how you pronounce that, was supposed to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson. This is Andrew Johnson here. Johnson lived at the Kirkwood House Hotel. Astaroth went to the hotel, but he kind of got cold feet and was kind of concerned about killing the, the vice president. And so he went to the bar of the Kirkwood Hotel and started drinking instead. And at some point, he lost his nerve completely. He left and was wandering around the, the city of Washington, D.C. for a few hours. Then he left Washington completely and never actually saw the vice president or attempted to kill him. So this was also a failed attempt. Now, the reason they targeted these three men, the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state, was the way the government was set up back then. Those were the only three that were named to be in succession, to be in line, to take over for the president if something happened, because they had no real thought that there would be a disaster big enough that would wipe out all three of those guys at the same time. They didn't plan on this assassination thing. Now it's established many, many, many steps down. Okay, if this one can't take it, then this one takes it. And if this one can't take it, then this one takes it. So you know, you would have to pretty much wipe out everybody in government to make sure that there was chaos. But the way it was set up now, if they had killed all three of those men, there would have been a senator that was designated that he would be appointed until they could have a special election to elect a new president. And it was going to take probably months to get all of this handled. So that's the reason they, they targeted these three men. April the 15th of 1865, President Lincoln was wounded. He was checked by a doctor, found to still be alive. So he was moved across the street to the Peterson boarding house. He died at 7.22 a.m. on April the 15th, the next morning, and Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton said, now he belongs to the ages, is this famous thing he said. Now, in the meantime, John Wilkes Booth had stopped at the home of Dr. Samuel Mudd in Bryantown in Maryland to have his leg splinted and bandaged, because remember, he broke his leg when he jumped off onto the stage. On April 21st of 1865, Lincoln's body left Washington on a funeral train. I think they said it was a nine car funeral train to return to his home in Illinois. <coughs> and he didn't just go straight from Washington to Illinois. They went up to New York City and over to Philadelphia and around to Chicago and all these big, big cities. It was a 1700 mile trip and there were many funeral processions because every big town that they stopped in Everybody would come and they would have a funeral parade and whatever and come to see President Lincoln. <coughs> in New York City, the six-year-old 
child who would grow up to become president that Theodore Roosevelt was watching from this window right here. This was his house. And if you look real close, you can see there's a little guy right there. That's President Roosevelt, future President Roosevelt. He watched the procession of Abraham Lincoln go through his town. On April 26th of 1865, Booth and David Harold were found in a tobacco barn on Garrett's Farm near Bowling Green, Virginia, by a cavalry unit under the command of Lieutenant Edward Doherty. The barn was set on fire. When Booth refused to come out, they set the barn on fire. Harold came out and surrendered, but Booth was shot and killed. He refused to surrender, and he was shot and killed by Corporal Boston Corbett. So Booth is dead. On May the 4th of 1865, Abraham Lincoln is buried at Springfield, Illinois, in the Oak Ridge Cemetery. And this is his monument and his tomb that's still there today. On May the 10th of 1865, they've rounded up almost all of the people they believe were involved in a conspiracy, and they convene a military commission, a military court, to try the conspirators. Now, this is one of the very few times that a military court has tried people <coughs> or held the trials for people who were not in the military. So that's a little unusual, a little bit weird. So who were all of the conspirators? The first one was Samuel Bland Arnold. He was a childhood friend of John Wilkes Booth. He was recruited by Booth for the kidnapping plot. He did not participate in the assassination plot. He was one of those that dropped out and said, yeah, I'm not interested in killing the president. But in any way, he was arrested in Virginia on April 17th of 1865. He was convicted of plotting to kidnap the president. He was sentenced to life in prison, but he was pardoned in 1869 by Andrew Johnson and allowed to go on about his business. George Astaroth worked as a ferry boat operator. He would had a, a boat that would go across the various rivers and stuff and carry uh, wagons and things across the river. He was recruited by Booth for his knowledge of the waterways. He helped in the kidnap plot and he was the one that was supposed to uh, assassinate Vice President Johnson. He was arrested on April 20th of 1865. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. David E. Harold was friends with George Astaroth and jo John Surratt, who we'll get to in a minute. He was supposed to guide Powell to Seward's house. He did that, and he was waiting outside, and he heard all the screaming going on in Seward's house, and he got a little bit concerned, and he took off. So he ended up meeting up with John Wilkes Booth and stayed with him until Booth was captured at Garrett's farm, or until they were captured at Garrett's farm. <clears throat> he was convicted and sentenced to death also. Dr. Samuel Mudd, had met with Booth and the conspirators several times. His house may have been set up as a safe house for, the, for Booth's escape. Mudd was the one that treated Booth's broken leg. He was tried and convicted of conspiracy and sentenced to life in prison. He was also later pardoned and released in 1869 by President Andrew Johnson. Michael O'Loughlin was also a childhood friend of Booth he was the earliest recruit to the kidnapping plot. He left the group when the kidnapping plot failed. He turned himself in on April 17th of 1865, even though he wasn't involved in the assassination plot. He was tried and sentenced to life in prison, <clears throat> and he probably would have been one of those that was pardoned by President Johnson, but he died of yellow fever in 1867. Lewis Powell was the youngest one of the conspirators. He was 21 when he got involved with all of this nonsense. He was assigned to kill Seward, you know, the Secretary of, of State, but he was unsuccessful. He went and did his best, but he was unsuccessful in killing Seward. He was captured, tried, convicted, <coughs> and also sentenced to death. I'm sorry, I've got a cough this morning. It's not COVID. I'm allergic to mountain cedar, and yesterday the mountain cedar was over 23,000, and it's, it's causing me some problems. So if I sound a little bit like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, that's why, and I'm sorry. Edmund, which is a weird spelling, Edmund Ned Spangler 
was a stagehand and a carpenter at Ford's Theater. So he just worked at Ford's Theater. He was a friend of John Wilkes Booth. I don't think they hung out, but they knew each other. He held Booth's horse in the back alley behind the theater during the assassination. John Wilkes Booth rode up and said, here, Ned, hold my horse for me. <clears throat> and Ned said, yeah, okay, sure. It's very unlikely he knew anything about the plot. He was not involved in any of the meetings. He never met, as far as anybody can tell, with the other conspirators. They didn't name him as a co-conspirator. All he did was hold Booth's horse for him. However, he was tried and convicted and sentenced to life in prison. He was also pardoned by President Johnson in 1869, and he ended up going with Dr. Mudd back to his farm and working there until he died in 1875. John Harrison Surratt Jr. was known to be a Confederate spy. He may be the one that started Booth thinking about this whole thing in the first place. We're not quite sure about that. But he also introduced Harold and Astaroth to, and Powell to Booth. He helped during the kidnapping plot, but during the assassination plot, he was actually in New York. So he wasn't there during the assassination plot. He heard about Lincoln being killed and Booth being the one that had done it. And so he fled to Canada and then to England. He was later arrested in 1866 in Egypt and extradited, that means to be returned by a legal process, to the United States. Now, he was not tried with those other people. He was tried by a civilian court. They ended in a hung jury, which meant that they couldn't get a majority that thought he was guilty. He was released and he was never tried again and he just went on living his life until 1916. <clears throat> his mother, Mary Surratt, owned a boarding house in Washington, D.C., where the conspirators met, and some of them actually lived there in that boarding house for a short period of time. After the assassination, Booth and Harold stopped for supplies at a tavern that she owned, <clears throat> and on the day of the assassination, she had gone down to that tavern and left a package for Booth and instructed the tavern keeper to have the guns ready in case they needed them when they got there. She was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death as well. On July the 7th of 1865, George Astaroth, <clears throat> David Harrod, Lewis Hap Powell and Mary Surratt were all executed by hanging at the old penitentiary in Washington, D.C. Mary Surratt was the first woman ever executed by the U.S. government. Um, interestingly enough, Robert Todd Lincoln, who was the only surviving son of Abraham Lincoln, they'd had two, two, two other sons, I believe, who had both died. But Robert Todd Lincoln was at his father's deathbed. 16 years later, he was serving as President James A. Garfield's Secretary of War when an assassin came up to President Garfield in a train station and shot him. Uh, Robert Todd Lincoln was there when that happened. And then later on, <clears throat> on September the 6th of 1901, he had just arrived at the Pan American Expo, which was like this big festival. And at the invitation of President William McKinley, he got there only to find out that President McKinley had been shot just a little bit sooner, a little bit earlier by an assassin, and he also died. So Robert Todd Lincoln witnessed three of the presidents that were assassinated. The only one he didn't see was, was John F. Kennedy because he was an old guy and he was already uh, Robert Todd Lincoln had already died before Kennedy was assassinated, but you got to wonder, would he have been there to see that one too? Because he seemed to turn up. <clears throat> okay, now, one of the things whoops, that people questioned and wondered about was the fact that Mary Surratt was hanged when she was much more peripheral on the edges of the conspiracy than her son, John Surratt, who was tried in a civilian court and was not hanged. So you got to wonder about that. What do you think? Tell me what you think about this. 
I'm not saying she was not involved. I'm, she was involved. I just think it's kind of weird that she had got hanged and her son, who was much more involved, got to go live his life. A little bit weird. That's all I have for you today. <coughs> Pardon me. Let me know what you think. Give me a thumbs up, like, and share. Tell me what you would like to hear me talk about next time. That's all I've got for you until next time. Thanks for watching. Okay, Sully. I think we're done. <laughs>